you ever looked at a picture of a chromosome, you know, it looks like a squiggly worm, and it's got a bunch of lines through it, you know, it's like striped. Those stripes are what are called chromatin bands. And chromatin bands come from the fact that the DNA in that location is tightly wound together, which means that there's a tremendous amount of actual genetic activity versus the vast majority of your gene, which does absolutely nothing. Those areas of chromatin striping are very highly charged areas. So if you can think of you, well, for instance, maybe you don't know this, but 90% uh, of your DNA does absolutely nothing. Okay, 4% of your DNA made you, and 5% of your DNA is a bunch of inactivated what's called retrovirus codes. In other words, it's virus codes that are still inside of you that got turned off millions of years ago. But it turns out more of your genetics are virus code that got turned off than are you. Uh, and turns out the nine-tenths of your genetics does absolutely nothing. So it's like going to uh, Amazon and buying a CD that's got, you know, one song and then, and then 55 minutes of white noise. That, that's what it turns out to be. So when we find those areas of banding, it means, hey, this is the real stuff. This is the real person here, not the virus DNA, not the nothing DNA. Well, if you look at the area where ABO is on chromosome 9, it's called band Q34. Highly dense, highly, highly configured. There's a lot of genetic activity that comes out of that particular locus of that gene that goes and regulates a variety of other cell functions. So you see, evolution thought, hey, that's not a bad place. People are routinely different over here. Let me code a few other things to happen when this happens. And that's why people a lot of times don't get blood type that much because they don't realize that when they go back to their education in medical school and they uncover that blood type is something on a red blood cell, they're only getting one twenty-fifth of the story. Your blood type is all over the place. It's in your tears. It's in your semen. It's in your vaginal secretions. It's in your digestive tract. It's lining your stomach. It's coding how you respond to stress. It's coding basically how viscous your blood is when you're stressed out. It codes your resistance to bacteria, viruses. It codes basically how you break down the material in your gut. What bacteria live in your gut? So there's a lot about blood type that really gives the name blood type. It's a misnomer because it really was given the name blood type because it is given this role in transfusion. But it's given the name because of its clinical role, not because of its biological significance. And yet when somebody who is in healthcare goes, well, blood types don't really matter. You might as well pick an astrological sign. They don't really know the wider significance. More of your blood type is embedded in the lining of your digestive tract than it is on your red blood cells, right? But we don't transfuse intestinal tracts between our cells. So we don't call it an intestinal type, we call it a blood type. This is what I learned in my, in my evolution through the whole thing, is that actually if you have an interesting idea that's at variance with the common understood knowledge, in other words, what's considered to be the knowledge on the subject, it's easier for people to just say, well, that's ridiculous, than it is for them to be curious and maybe take the concept further. So the second lesson that I learned is that often what masquerades as skepticism is actually somebody who's not inherently very curious because there were oodles of examples to educate people the wider role that blood type had. Nobody took them up unless you went to a conference that we threw or you got into reading some of the references. I actually had somebody who wrote me one time, who was a medical doctor several years ago, he said, I was getting ready to write a critical thing on your book, and then he said, at least I'll do you the service. I, I went back and looked at your references, and he said, it was, I was blown away. I had no idea that these things were like that in the literature. Nobody ever taught me that. But how many times do people write something, it's not necessarily that they're trying to criticize it from an even hand. It's like time it goes back to, how are you ever going to make a vegan happy if you're saying some people should eat protein? How are you ever going to make a paleo guy happy if you say some people do well on carbohydrates? How are you ever going to make an anti-soy person happy if you say some people have anti-cancer effects from soy? Everyone with their pet theories, you come along and you find special needs and special situations and purposes, and their general thing is that it's a kind of a threatening thing because all of a sudden the simplicity that's involved in how we approach things has been not, is actually being addressed. And that's, you know, diet messages that are simple do very well in this world. You sell a lot of diet books if you just say, hey, you know, here, drink a lot of cabbage, you know, eat a lot of pineapple. Uh, and maybe that's, the, you know, a statement of the industry. But as a naturopath, I have been taught from the beginning, food is medicine. Not food is a way to get into a tuxedo before your sister's wedding. Food is a way of treating your illnesses. Food is a way of preventing your illnesses. Food is a functional component in the diet. 
I saw a, a thing on YouTube, it was a nutrition film from the 1930s. I was looking for some B-roll. I wanted some funny stuff to put in the front of a film I was making. Turns out this darn nutrition film was pretty good, and it was made in the 1930s. It said, people are fat because there's two types of foods. There's protective foods, and then they had a shot of celery and tomatoes and a glass of milk. And then it said, there's energy foods, and they had a shot of a piece of pie and, and all sorts of other things. They said, people are fat because they eat too much of these and not enough of these. And that's the bottom line, is that actually, if the only thing you're going to look at is food as energy source, then all you need to do is put people on calorie restriction diets and everything should be fine. But how many people have you ever seen who lost weight who wound up actually looking worse than they did before? We'll get to that in a little while anyway. So that's, the pre that's sort of the preface to this lecture. It's not necessarily, that's not the lecture, by the way. So anyway, where I went after blood type was I was looking to see, okay, blood type is a big gene. It's not the only gene, okay? There's lots of other things. It's a big influence on digestive tract and immune function, but it can't be the only influence on digestive tract and immune function. But even more importantly, I started to see as I was going through the gen genetics research that there was a revolution going on in genetics, and food was going to play a major role in it, and it seemed like I was already there because of what I was doing with blood type. And that revolution is what's called here epigenetics. Now, Epi just means above and beyond. So when you're epi anything, it just means I'm above and beyond that. I guess epinephrine is above and beyond phenephrine or something. But nonetheless, epigenetics is the genetics above genetics. And to understand that, you have to understand what genetics is. To a certain degree, it's, this is not a class in genetics. But basically, uh, you might remember from high school, you know, Mendel had his pea plants, you had some purple plants, you had some white plants, they go together, some are dominant, some are recessive, some genes turn other genes off. That's classic genetics. In other words, the whole theory of uh, dominant recessive and the whole theory that genetic change occurs as part of a long process of natural selection and point mutation. So in other words, the idea that butterflies are gray in Manchester, England, is that Manchester, England is a sooty place and white butterflies stand out to predators more than gray butterflies do. So it's this idea that gene change and species change only occurs over very long periods of time as the ineffective versions get weeded out, allowing the more effective versions to reproduce. Classic natural selection, classic Darwinism. Well, we can throw this into a pot and say that's probably true, but it's really more accurately describes essentially how an amoeba goes from point A to point B, not necessarily how something as complicated as you or I go from point A to point B. We couldn't sit around and say that our next evolution is going to occur through the natural selection because our environmental conditions change too fast. In other words, if you go and buy a house next to a gas station, your environmental conditions changed very fast given the day you bought that house versus the day you didn't have that house. Okay, so now, are you going to just wait for natural selection to kill you so that all the people dumb enough to buy a house next to a gas station die out and the only people who are left are the people smart enough to not buy a house next to a gas station? No. You have to have a series of adaptations that are independent of that, that are a little bit more in present time kind of thing, a little bit more fast acting. That's where epigenetics comes in.